Netanyahu, you know, he's the Trump of Israel, just like Trump is the Netanyahu of America. They're both consistent gangsters. Dr. Cornell West is one of America's most prominent scholars and activists. He's written over a dozen books and taught at some of the country's most prestigious universities. And now he's running for president as an independent, and he joins us to talk Gaza, Biden, and the US elections. Dr. Cornell West, thank you so much for joining us on Real Talk Online. No, thank you, my dear brother. Appreciate the, uh, the coming conversation. How do you define the US government's Gaza policy currently? You know, it reminds me in many ways of uh, Vietnam in the times of Martin Luther King Jr., Stokely Carmichael, and Diane Nash, that Gaza is a historic turning point in the American empire. A historic like turning point, you're saying? That's right. Historic, pivotal point in the history of the American empire. Very much like the Algerian war with the French empire between 1954 and 62. Very much like the Suez Canal in 1956, vis-a-vis -vis the British Empire. The American Empire is in the process of deep decline and decay. And what Gaza does is rip the veil and reveal an American criminality, an American hypocrisy, an American immorality that's been parading as this force for democracy and force for freedom around the world. Now, of course, so many brothers and sisters, especially in the global south, have seen this before, given all of the U.S. supports of the coups. We've seen it in Iran, we've seen it in Guatemala, we've seen it in, in, in Grenada, we've seen it in so many other places, overthrowing democratic governments. But the whole world now sees in real time immeasurable, indescribable suffering of our precious Palestinian brothers and sisters with genocidal assaults, with ethnic cleansing, and the apartheid conditions, so that Israel, as a satellite of the American empire, becomes the mediating force to reveal to the world the American criminality. Now, of course, it's also Israeli criminality as well, uh, but for the most part, it could not proceed without American money, without American bombs, without American military support and without American cover at, at the United Nations. Well, if I bring it to what's happening on in the political climate today and uh, on the U.S. front, uh, recently when Kamala Harris was asked if, you know, U.S. aid to Israel would be used as leverage, she said we mustn't conflate between the Israeli people and, and, and the Israeli government, which sends a message that, you know, that the U.S. wouldn't use aid as some sort of leverage. How do you see that? Well, it's, it's not even a question of of the aid or not. Just, just, just look at how morally bankrupt the U.S. policy is in terms of creating a port on the one hand, and you're providing billions and billions of dollars to facilitate and enable the genocide on the other. Why? Because you won't confront the right-wing Jewish elites who are themselves making the decision to pursue the, the genocide, but America creates a condition for that pursuit. And so uh, Kamala Harris and the others would have to acknowledge, and I've, I've said this on many occasions, their particular policy makes them war criminals. And there's no way you can uh, attenuate your war criminality by providing humanitarian aid. No, you've got to shatter the conditions for the very possibility of the genocide. You don't allow the genocide and then come in with some charity. No, no, not at all, not at all. It's the larger framework that needs to be examined. And I tell you this, my brother, at a very deeper moral level, because I speak also as come, one coming out of the uh, revolutionary black Christian tradition of Martin King and Fannie Lou Hamer, the fundamental problem of Washington's imperial policies is that they really do not believe that a Palestinian life and a Palestinian baby has the same value as a Jewish life and a Jewish baby. You don't think because they see it that just way? What happened, they don't see it that way because their assumptions are so deep, but, I, but everybody knows and the whole world knows. If there were a Palestinian genocidal assault on Jews and Jewish babies were being killed at the level and intensity that Palestinian babies were being killed, the U.S. government have a qualitatively different policy 
In fact, the U.S. government would support the Jewish version of Hamas because you know U.S. government has a history of supporting various groups that kill innocent people when they conform with U.S. foreign interests. So you can see when there's white babies or Jewish babies, we have one response. When there's Palestinian babies or brown babies or black babies, we have another response. So there's a racist element here. And that needs to be pointed out. And that would be also part of a West administration telling the truth. The condition of truth is to allow suffering to speak, my brother. Well, I, I guess the obvious question here, Dr. West, is well, what would you be doing if you were in the White House in this situation? Oh, if I was in the White House, first I'd have to tell the American people and the world the truth. I'd have to tell the truth going back to 1970 with the Balfour Declaration and the British Empire providing this particular land for Jewish people. Now, Jewish people themselves have been terrorized and traumatized There's no, and hated for 2,000 years. There's no doubt about that. That was a, that was a European greed and hatred and jews jumped out of those burning buildings of europe and landed on the backs of arabs and they told lies they said there was nobody there they said there was no people there that's not true there were there were thousands and thousands of people there and they had to choose to coexist or dominate and they opted for jabotinsky and of course nathan yahoo's father was an assistant for jabotinsky jabotinsky said what we must dominate and if possible, annihilate these people. Well, see, that's sick. That is as fascist as you can get. And so the American people need to know the truth. Then you move to policy. Mm. And you say, that's why we're going to end the occupations. We're going to end the siege. We're going to stop the war. We're going to make sure that we do all we can to ensure that there is Palestinian dignity and equality as well as Jewish security and safety. We don't want the annihilation and we don't want the massacre of any peoples, no matter who they are. But we are not going to sit back and somehow think that you can have a security and safety of Jews on the necks of Palestinians. There's going to be equality and dignity across the board and we're going to come together and, 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 and come up with ways in which we can achieve that. That's what you would hear in a West administration. Hmm. And if we bring it to, to Biden's recent comments, Dr. West, I mean, he said that he has a red line when it comes to Israel invading Rafah. Yeah, in the same interview, he said that he would also never leave Israel. Now, that's contradicting or confusing at best, don't you think? Well, he's made it clear he has no red line. You know, he's just talking. He's just talking. I mean, he is the candidate who has received one hundred over one hundred million dollars from APEC. APEC is the lobby that ensures that congressmen and presidents and others will defer to Israeli policy. He's been at that for decades, so he doesn't really have a red line at all. What he's concerned about is the election. He's got myself and others coming at him directly with what? With the truth, with the love of people, mm. including the love of Palestinian people. Mm. With what? People waking up and seeing his, not just hypocrisy, but his criminality. That's, that's, that's what I wanted that, to get at. Is that why, why did you call him a war criminal? Or why, why do you call him a war criminal? Because what is taking place right now in Gaza is not just a war crime and a crime against humanity. It is a crime of genocide. But he would disagree he with you, Dr. West. I mean, he, he even just said in, in, in his recent interview, he's, he, he basically refused to concede that it was a widely shared sentiment that what's happening in, Israel, in Gaza is genocide. Well, I mean, we, we, we got the international court of justice that's already against him but i don't even believe it's just a matter of the court that if you see for yourself based on the definition of genocide which is the wholesale attack on the part of the whole of a group that undermines the condition of their living from health care to food starvation as weapon against them and so forth that is genocide and even people want to argue whether it's genocide or not it's such a indescribable crime against humanity that even the semantic debate is a distraction. 
and he has no deep sense of urgency, no sense of 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 of, 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 of emergency about it. It's just a particular electoral political calculation that he makes. That's what upsets me about not just him, all of these gen these Democrats who are enabling genocide. Each and every one of them, from the House to the Senate, the State House, the City Council. If you can't meet this moral test, it's clear that you have hardly any moral fiber in you as human beings. Now, as politicians, you can play the electoral game. But I come from a black folk. We were played the electoral game for over 200 and some years in American democracy. All the fashionable liberal politicians couldn't say a word about lynching. They couldn't even pass a lynching bill in the history of America. It began in 1901, and they finally passed it a few, uh, a few years ago. That's sick, my brother. Mm. That's true with my indigenous brothers and sisters here. And that's why this is the Malcolm X moment. The chickens are coming home to roost for the American empire. The chickens are coming home to roost for American democracy. You are going to reap what you sow. Sooner or later, truth crushed the earth shall rise again. Lies, hiding crimes, cannot live forever. This is what we're experiencing right now. And you see it among the younger generation across the board. Black, white, red. You see it among our Jewish brothers and sisters. And if not now, and Jewish forces for peace. And you certainly see it among Muslims and Arabs in the United States. And of course, we, we've got our own critique of the Arab countries not having a sense of emergency and, and, and urgency here as well. Sure, I'm, I'm gonna get to the Arab American vote in a second, but I, I wanted to, just to get your opinion on how you've been seeing Netanyahu's reactions to Biden's criticism. I mean, he's been basically doubling down and rejecting any of Biden's criticisms publicly. Well, no, see, Netanyahu, you know, he's the Trump of Israel. Just like Trump is and Nathan Yahoo of America, they're both consistent gangsters. You see, they don't, they don't, they don't pander. You see, so Nathan Yahoo is saying up front, look, I am going to pursue this genocidal war, period. And he's got his talking points. We're gonna kill all of Hamas so that 13,000 children, each one of them is a shield for Hamas. You see how sick that is? You see how ridiculous and ludicrous that is? But that's his talking point, and he follows through. So he has a consistency in his criminality and his gangster activity. Trump is the same way within the, the bounds of the American empire. It's Biden and others who want to act like they're so concerned. I mean, Biden, so Biden was caught saying he'll, uh, that he'll have a come to Jesus meeting with Netanyahu soon in a, in a hot mic. I don't know if you have any thoughts on if, that. If he, can't, if he can't have a come to Jesus meeting after 10 innocent children are killed, let alone 13,000 are killed, you know that he's just talking? He's a hypocrite. Hmm. He's not honest. He'll say almost anything to win votes. Well, speaking of votes, let's let's talk about the Arab American vote. I mean, Biden's approval ratings, they went from 59% in 2020 to 17% in 2023 last year among amongst the Arab American community. And, you know, obviously there's reports that he's going to face challenges in in three battleground states, Georgia, Michigan, Pennsylvania. How do you see this play out with the Arab American vote? Well, he, he's simply not going to he's not going to gain any significant a Muslim or Arab, Arab American vote. There's no doubt about that. And no matter what he does, it's too late. It's too little, too late. There's too many precious Palestinians who have been, who have been not just murdered, but maimed. And even Palestinians who are alive. You know, what kind of lives are we talking about in the rubble, in the ruins? Let's be very, very honest about this. So that the very notion that somehow he can do X or Y as a way of responding to an electoral constituency whose grandmothers and grandfathers and mothers or fathers are being systematically murdered. You see, that, that, that there's nothing he can do, and understandably so. And I think part of the problem is, is that he's, he's incapable, it seems, of really casting this in a serious moral and spiritual framework. It's only tactical in regard to election. And that in and of itself is an insult to 
anybody, let alone Arabs and Muslims, to view the killings of our family members as just another moment for electoral political calculation. Right. And is, is this why you said, Dr. West, is this why you said that the Democrats, the, they see Muslims and Arabs in the U.S. as interest groups? That's right. But that's why they're beyond redemption. But that's this is what happens when empires begin to implode and the, the willful blindnesses that they have uh, render them actually contributing to their own destruction. And, that, and that's very much where we are as an empire. The whole world sees it, but on the inside, and you've been to the country, you see, my God, the level of homelessness, the levels of poverty. They say the economy is doing so well, so well, yet three individuals have wealth equivalent to 160 million people. Three individuals have wealth equivalent to 50% of the American citizenry, and yet you got all these pundits talking about how, how beautiful the economy is. You see, that, that kind of ideological cover is just as bad in some ways as the vetoes of the resolutions in the United Nations when you're calling for humanitarian aid of people undergoing genocide. So you're saying That's the media the has a role favorite. as well. The media is also complicit oh, in your view. Oh, a major role, my brother, a major role. You're supposed to be involved in truth-telling. Hmm. Where's the outrage when the Palestinian journalists or the progressive Israeli journalists who were killed, who were lied on? Where is the outrage for Julian Assange as a journalist exposing the lies of the American empire? And of course, we haven't even got to, to the great Mumia Abul Jamal and the great H. Rat Brown or uh, Amin Jamal, Abdullah Al Hamin, and so forth, you see. So that we have to just be honest. And it's very difficult to be honest because it takes bravery and courage. And most of our politicians are cowards, man. They, they, they're in a system of legalized bribery and normalized corruption. Hmm. They, they're well adjusted to an unjust status quo. They don't want to tell the truth. They don't want to straighten their backs up and pursue justice. And what does that mean? Well, it means for me, they are slapping Martin Luther King Jr. in the face in the grave. Yeah. And that for me is not just sacrilegious, but that is an undermining of the best of not just America. It's an undermining of the best of the human spirit. And, and you have written so much about race relations, particularly in the U.S., uh, Dr. West. And I wanted to ask you about this. I mean, how have you been seeing Gaza play out in the African-American communities in America? Well, it's been a very, very uh, sad affair in terms of, of black voices being too scared and intimidated to actually call for not just a ceasefire, but the end for occupation. So much of black organizations and black leaders themselves have been shaped by either APEC or being shaped by big uh, 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 influence, by big money, by big title that doesn't allow them to speak from the depths of their moral souls, which is another way of saying we've got sellout. We've got folk who have given up in serious truth telling in order to preserve their positions. And this is true not just in, in government, it's true across across the board. And so the black freedom struggle has always been the leaven in the American loaf. You see, it's always been the expander and the enabler in American democracy. Once you have so much black leadership that is intimidated and scared and afraid, then the black freedom movement itself becomes weaker and if it becomes weaker, it's no accident that democratic forces as a whole become weaker. Now, there's other democratic forces, which is beautiful. We talked about that before. Mm -hmm. The young people, the Arabs, the Muslims, and, mm -hmm. and so forth. Uh, and it, it, there's a gender element here, too. I think the, uh, the women of different colors have been much, much stronger than the men of different colors. But I, I'm simply here as a candidate to say mm -hmm. that I come from a great black people who produce love warriors in the face of hatred, who produce freedom fighters in the face of, of U.S. terrorism, of lynching and Jim Crow and Jane Crow, and of wounded healers in the face of trauma. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to hold up that bloodstained banner, which means I'm in deep solidarity with oppressed people around the world. And yes, that includes 
my precious Palestinian brothers and sisters in Gaza. And, and you've also been critical of African Americans in, in power. So what do you make of, you know, current African Americans who, who hold uh, public office right now? I mean, I, I think of Linda Thomas Greenfield, who's become the face of the U.S. veto in, in, uh, at the Security um, uh, Council, the U.N. Security Council. But then there's also Kamala Harris, there's Lloyd Austin. I mean, what do you make uh, of, of these African Americans holding public office right now? Well, these black faces in high places are there because... Black faces in high places. Is that... Right. That's exactly... Black faces in high imperial places are there because of the struggles, the blood, sweat, and tears of everyday black people and other folk who joined the Black Freedom Movement. Now they get there and they become rationalizers and justifiers of genocide, of ethnic cleansing. So again, it's hypocrisy. They become complicitous with American criminality. So the same thing with Obama, right? Dropping drones on innocent people in Somalia and Pakistan and Afghanistan. You got seven wars going on at the same time, dropping 25,000 bombs a year and walking around with a Nobel Peace Prize. Well, you see, that's just ridiculous. But but then you, Dr. What happens to the legacies of Malcolm X and Martin King and Fannie Lou Hamer and Curtis Mayfield and John Coltrane? We can go on Nina Simone. That tradition must be made highly visible. So it's not a question of what color you are, your skin pigmentation. It's a question of whether you have the courage to choose integrity, honesty, decency, seeking justice, and being willing to take the hit, being willing to pay the price, being willing to bear the burden. But then you, you see how one could turn around, Dr. West, and be like, well, you're critical of all these public figures, but you yourself, you're running to be the head of this American empire, as you, as you call it. You're absolutely right. I'm running to be head of the American empire in order to dismantle the American empire, in order to disinvest from military and reinvest in the satisfaction of basic social needs of health care and housing and safe communities uh, and, and quality education. And yes, I'm also running because I think the best of America and, and the best of America is still America. The best of America is the black freedom struggle. It is though constitute is constituted by those Americans of all colors who have decided to opt for truth, justice, and love. And of course, that's the, that's the slogan of my campaign, right? Mm -hmm. Truth, condition of truth, choose allow suffering to speak, justice, justice is what love looks like in public, and the courage that undergirds it, the willingness to cut against the grain. And I am an internationalist. That is to say, America does not have to be an empire. It must not be an empire. It must be one nation among nations. So that I believe that a baby in Ethiopia, in Guatemala, in Singapore, in New York, in Gaza, in Tel Aviv, they all have the same value. That's my egalitarian internationalism. And I'm deeply committed to that. And I think at, at this particular historical moment as the American empire implodes, that the best of America ought to be part and parcel of the conversation, of the struggle, and I tell you this, my brother, well, we know Biden might run out of gas and give up, Trump may be on his way to jail, and we win. And when we win, I'm not going to the White House until every citizen has a house. But what about those who are saying that, you know, this is this is a, you know, Cornell West, you're following in the footsteps of Ralph Nader, you know, that, that you're in 2024, that you're becoming basically, you could possibly be an, an enabler of Trump going into the White House. No, I would say that each candidate has to win and earn their votes. 40% hmm. of Americans do not vote at all. I spent a lot of time with them. But do they care about politics? Well, a lot of times they, 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 they either care and it's just given up because they know how rotten the system is, you know. Yeah. And sometimes they don't because they're just too busy. They're struggling, trying to survive and what have you. But the notion that somehow somebody can run for office, especially somebody who 
who they know at the moment has much lower percentage that they become the major or primary cause for the whole system. Right. That shows again the hypocrisy of it. You see, if Biden can't make a case, he can't make a case. If Trump can't make a case, he can't make a case. People vote for each one of those because they think they made a case. They vote for me, they think I made a case. Right. Yet each candidate has to earn their votes. And of course, it, it could be the other way around too. They could be stealing from me. <laughs> if you're going to use those kind of terms, I don't I don't speak in those terms. I just think each candidate makes the case and people choose. Right. My last question for you, Dr. West. I mean, you've been very outspoken for Gaza and for the situation on the ground. But again, how you you know, obviously voicing support and all and, and calling for a ceasefire, it, it only goes so far. So how can you really say something or do something that implements change on the ground well all we can do is hit the streets all we can do is go to jail all we can do is put our bodies where our mouths are when we're not in the situation itself uh but also on a very personal level though brother we just want our precious palestinian brothers and sisters to know that i they feel so all alone they feel as if the world doesn't care they feel as if they are invisible. And we're out there every week to tell them, you are not invisible. We care and love you. We're concerned about you. And I say that to each and every oppressed group, be they in Sudan, I would have said the same thing to Jews in the 1930s. I was saying the same thing to black folk every day of my life. Same thing to indigenous people every week. You have to express yourself at that level of deep, deep moral and spiritual solidarity because we I don't have the political and economic power at the moment, but I can still raise my voice and that's the anthem of black people. Lift every voice. Mm -hmm. And that voice is tied to a vision. And that vision is driven by a vocation. And that vocation is undergird by the virtue of courage. And many of us would rather be dead than afraid we'd rather be a corpse than a coward and on that note dr cornell west i thank you so much for joining us on real talk online it's a real pleasure and i, I wish you the best of luck with the campaign i truly do i salute you my brother you stay strong god bless your loved ones man thank you dr west thank you so much <laughs>